And welcome back to American Islamic College, because I know all of you have been here before. So thanks for coming out in the, this weather and joining us. Um, again, just a reminder, in front of you, you have feedback forms. If you kindly fill those out at the end of the program, it will help us to know where to improve. And you also have the opportunity to give your suggestions for topics and um, speakers that you would find interesting. You'll also find donation cards in front of you if you are able to make a monetary donation. We greatly appreciate it um, so that we can continue to offer these types of programs for free, which is what we love to do. Um, and finally, you all can silence your phones if you want any disturbances during the talk. Thanks. So tonight we have with us a distinguished guest, one of our own, Dr. Fariel Salam. She is the Associate Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies, as well as Director of the Master of Divinity and Muslim Chaplaincy Program here at American Islamic College. She's joining us from Hartford Seminary, where she directed its Islamic Chaplaincy Program for several years. She earned her PhD from the University of Chicago in Islamic Studies. Her research interests include Islamic philosophy and theology in the post-classical period, interfaith dialogue, and the development of Muslim thought in the contemporary era as it came into conversation with aspects of modernity. Dr. Salam was recently named one of CNN's 25 Influential American Muslims for her work in higher education. She is the author of The Emergence of Early Sufi Piety and Sunni Scholasticism, Abdullah bin al-Mubarak and the Formation of Sunni Identity in the Second Islamic Century. And this is what we're going to be hearing more of tonight. So, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Fariel Salam. Assalamu alaikum, good evening. Thank you all for coming out here today in this cold weather, <clears throat> Chicago weather. So, my topic today is uh, my book that I recently published. The title is The Emergence of Sufi Piety and Sunni Scholasticism, subtitle, uh, Abdullah bin Mubarak and the Formation of Sunni Identity in the Second Islamic Century. So I will give you all uh, the basics that, um, to cover this book. And the book is here, so if you would like to take a look at it, um, Yeah, you could just pass that around. <clears throat> so, why Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak? Why is he significant? I like to call Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak the Forrest Gump of the second Islamic century. Everyone seen the movie Forrest Gump? So, what's special about Forrest Gump? He played dumb, but was really smart. Okay, he played dumb, but he was really smart. But there's something else also that's significant about him, or, or the movie. He lived through many ages of event, major events. And so yeah, on. yeah. So through looking at his life, we put together, we pieced together the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, right? So Abdullah bin Mubarak is the Forrest Gump of the second century. Looking at his life, you're able to piece together many of the trends that were happen happening in this formative period of the second Islamic century. So you see him there, he's with John Lennon, he meets JFK, he plays against the Chinese, he's, at v he's in Vietnam, he, me he meets Nixon. Yeah. Okay. So Ibn al-Mubarak, he lived in the second Islamic century. Uh, he died in 181. He was born in 118 during the Umayyad period. Uh, his title is Amir al-Mu'minin, Commander of the Faithful in Hadith Transmission. Uh, he contributed to Islamic law at its early phases uh, of development. He participated in jihad and composed poetry and engaged in numerous theological discussions during his time. Uh, his writings on piety were among the earliest and later influenced the development of the field of Sufism or Islamic spirituality, virtue ethics in a systematic way. So he's the first person to start writing about um, or systematically compiling hadiths on the Prophet's piety and the early generation's piety. Uh, 
the biography of Ibn al-Mubarak, who lived during the formative period of Islamic thought, gives us an insight into the evolution of Zuhd, Hadith, and Jihad. His life and works distinctively illuminate the second century dynamics of the nascent Sunni tradition. So this book focuses on two questions. It asks two questions. What are the origins of Sufism and what is Sunni Islam? And the book is divided into three main sections. Uh, the first is Hadith, the second is Jihad, and the third is Zuhd and, or Piety. And for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus on Hadith and Zuhd. So Ibn al-Mubarak and the Hadith tradition. <coughs> so Ibn al-Mubarak's teachers include Ma'amar ibn Rashid, who was a key link between Ibn al-Mubarak's generation and the generation before. Uh, Malik and Ma'amar were from the foremost students of Az-Zuhri. So if you recall, Az-Zuhri, who died in 99, was the uh, individual that Omar II uh, commissioned to compile hadith in a written format. Before that, hadiths had not been written down and compiled into texts. Uh, so Zuhri there uh, uh, is that key link there for the beginning of a systematic study and transmission of hadith. Um, Sufyan al-Thawri is one of the key uh, transmitters of ha hadith in Kufa. So this is another teacher of Ibn al-Mubarak is Sufyan al-Thawri. He's known for his piety and he's also a merchant. He was a business person. Uh, his title is also Amir al-Mu'minin and hadith and um, he had uh, one of the most, most elite ranks in hadith transmission. So uh, scholars of hadith, you say Sufyan al-Thawri, everybody knows who uh, he is. When you say the two Sufyans, who are they? Sufyane. Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Sufyan al-Thawri, the two Sufyans, famous Suf uh, Sufyans of Hadith. So these were his teachers. The other Sufyan, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, was also his teacher. Was he Egyptian? Um, I think, so. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, Shurba ibn Hajjaj is another important hadith transmitter, and Ibn Nahiya, who is an Egyptian and he was a weak hadith transmitter, was also one of his teachers and is included in books of biographical dictionaries as having been one of his teachers. And I, if we have time, we'll go into why that's significant, but I do talk about it in the book. Who were the students of Ibn al-Mubarak? So whenever you study hadith, you look at, or you find the individual, and then you look at their teachers, and you look at their students. And when you open the tabaqat literature, the biographical dictionaries, it says, Rawa an, so he uh, uh, studied from, or he transmitted hadith from, that means those were his teachers. Wa rawa anhu, so these were the people who transmitted from him. So among his students is Ibn Ma'in, and uh, these are, Ibn Ma'in is one of Ibn al-Mubarak's most influential students. He was crucial, he was a crucial figure in the development of the field of hadith criticism, jarh wa ta'adil. And his success contributed to the continuation of Ibn al-Mubarak's work and its incorporation into the work of other hadith transmitters. So it's not just important that a teacher is a great teacher, but also that they have great students. And that's how a teacher's knowledge was transmitted and uh, kept alive was if they had a group of students that transmitted their knowledge. So Ibn Ma'in is one of the most important and key students of Ibn al-Mubarak who transmits his teachings and his hadiths to the next generation. Um, and we have uh, much of Ibn al-Mubarak's hadiths through these uh, important trans, uh, transmitters. Um, Ibn Ma'in served as a link between Ibn al-Mubarak and uh, many of the hadith transmitters who became known as the compilers of the canonical texts such as Bukhari, Muslim, and Abu Dawud. So Ibn Ma'in was their teacher. 
Um, many of you are familiar with the canonical hadith text, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood. So Ibn al-Mubarak was the teacher of their teacher. He was among the most important hadith critics and a teacher of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. This is Ibn Ma'in. Uh, his primary contribution to hadith studies were his biographical dictionaries that ranked thousands of transmitters according to a rigorous a uh, methodology known as jarh wa tadi. and his method was built upon his method was built upon the rudimentary systems developed by his predecessor and his teacher Ibn al-Mubarak so he further developed what he learned from his teacher Ibn al-Mubarak and these were the teachers of Bukhari Muslim Abu Dawood so he had pretty important students and teachers Biographical Dictionaries and Tabaqat's Literature. There is a good article by uh, Dr. Wadad Qadi, if you're interested in a summary of what are biographical dictionaries and what are some of the important uh, uh, texts or volumes to study. And the name of the article is Biographical Dictionaries as the Scholars' Alternative History of the Muslim Community. Um, <laughs> Some of the features of the biographical dictionary or dictionaries is that they are ranked um, generationally and they are informed by isnad. So if you look up a person in a biographical dictionary, it tells you who their teachers were and who their students were, where they lived, when they lived. And if you want to see if so-and-so really transmitted from so-and-so, you go find uh, Ibn Ma'i, and you find who he transmitted from, who he transmitted from him. And then you see if it matches with his teacher, Ibn al-Mubarak. Who did he transmit to, who transmitted from him. And then you go to Sufyan al-Thawri and see if that matches, or, and you look up Zuhri. So by looking all of these individuals up in <coughs> prosopographical uh, literature or biographical dictionaries, one is able to put together a um, generational or a chronological history of uh, scholars who lived at this time. And what's interesting is if you look at texts that use the term tarikh or history, you would, uh, uh, we often might assume that they're uh, ordered chronologically the way historical texts are um, in English literature, but Islamic texts uh, uh, with the term tarikh are often uh, ordered through tabaqat, through generations which is important because it indicates how uh, Sunni Muslims perceived themselves and the continuation or the transmission of what uh, they had. So the scholarly networks were the backbone of the communal proto-Sunni identity. Proto means before they actually started using the term Sunni, the term Sunni appears uh, during the time of Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi, for example, if you read his texts. He lived during the third and fourth centuries. And by that time, the term Sunni is being used clearly. Before that, the more common term was Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Uh, historical reports indicate that Ibn al-Mubarak traveled and met scholars from uh, diverse geographic backgrounds. Uh, such as Transoxiana. Ibn al-Mubarak himself was from Transoxiana. So he wasn't from the Arab world. He was of Turkic heritage. He came from the uh, Mawara and Nahr, what we would call Transoxiana. Uh, he was also, he spent time in Baghdad, Kufa, Medina, and Syria. We also have evidence that the networks of scholars he studied with knew of and were aware of their scholarly peers in distant regions. So they all knew each other. How did they all know each other? Ibn al-Mubarak spent a period of time in Syria under the tutelage of al-Awza'i. In this report, we see a reference to al-Awza'i's initial disdain for Abu Hanifa, about whom he asked Ibn al-Mubarak with skepticism Oh, Khurasani, who is this man coming out of Kufa, right? So, and then there's a story of how he brings the works of uh, Abu Hanifa to Awza'i without using the name Abu Hanifa. He calls him Norman, which is his name also. 
And then uh, Awza'i says, this is amazing. Who wrote this? He says, this is the Abu Hanifa that you didn't like. So, um, but what's uh, important here is that they all know, knew each other. How was Awza'i aware of what was happening in Kufa? Right, he's in uh, Syria, greater Syria, and he's talking about the scholar that everybody's debating and talking about out in Iraq. So, Hajj and Hadith trips. This was one very important way of the cross-pollinization of knowledge. So, um, it was like a network. So, many of you might go to ISNA, many of you might go to AAR. What happens at these conventions? All of the scholars come together, they meet, they exchange ideas, uh, people find out what other professors are writing about, what their research is on. So these are essential conventions that um, are important for keeping that network of scholarship alive. So during the early period, the Hajj trips played this kind of a role as well. So Hajj and Rihla fi Talab al -Ain. These were two trips, two kinds of travel that allowed ideas to travel with them because obviously they didn't have internet and TV and all of these quick communications that we have today. So the question is, well, how did they all know each other? How was this network connected? So the annual pil pilgrimage to Mecca was a meeting point for, for scholars from all over the Muslim world where ideas, hadiths, and new developments in the Islamic sciences were shared. The reports regarding Ibn al-Mubarak indicate that the annual pilgrimage played a prominent role in the life of this figure who not only went to Mecca once to fulfill his obligation, but rather he performed the Hajj every other year. So, and this is tough without airplanes and you know boats and th ways to get there. He used to make it out there every other year. So one year he would be doing jihad, one year he would be in um, going on Hajj. In Mecca, he met Sufyan al thawri he met Fudayl ibn Ayyad. These are some of the big names of Islamic uh, spirituality, and Sufyan is a big name in Hadith, as well as spirituality. And uh, this demonstrates why he was such a big figure. He was at Hajj every other year and had access to the latest information, Hadith debates, uh, others would not have had. The other way that knowledge spread and was uh, pollinized, this cross-pollinization of knowledge, was through what we know as rihla fi talab al So individual scholars took long travels to seek knowledge from scholars in different geographic areas. And these are known uh, as uh, hadith trips, or travel for the sake of knowledge. And they became so common among students scholars and hadith transmitters that it got a title in and of itself. And this continues today. You'll see many Muslims, young people will travel to seek knowledge. Um, it's not so much hadith anymore, just general knowledge and different topics. But um, uh, through students and scholars and teachers who had been traveling to different locations, knowledge was spread and uh, people became aware of each other. Just as, um, just as Ibn al-Mubarak uh, showed Awza'i the text that Abu Hanifa had written and uh, Awza'i was impressed with what he read. That's just one example of how this would have worked. So Constructive Critics, this is a really important book by Scott Lucas. He, uh, he questions or he re-examines common perceptions of how Sunni Islam had been defined until his time um, by, uh, by many Orientalist scholars. And then does he lay special stress on the Hadith? Yes, yeah. So he mentions that uh, before his time, uh, Western scholarship on Sunni Islam focuses on two different fields to try to make a case for identifying or defining Sunni Islam, either theology or law. And uh, this, those scholars which emphasize theology, he names as Montgomery Watt, Fazlur Rahman, and jo uh, Joseph Van Es. 
So these are big names who focused on theology and argued that Sunni Islam is defined by um, theological positions that certain scholars took. So, for example, he says, Watt relies heavily on classical sources by Muslim scholars who focus on sectarianism to define Sunni Islam. Rahman regards Sunni Islam as being primarily a reaction to the Mu'tazili and Shiite trends until it takes its fully developed form under the theological reasoning of al-Ash'ari. Van S too focuses on sectarianism in the early uh, period and links many of the major hadith figures such as Sufyan al-Thawri to their theological stances, despite the fact that this was not by any means the most important achievement of their scholarly careers by which they were known. This is a quote from his book. And then you have Schacht, Joseph Schacht, who starts a legalistic definition of Sunni Islam. So Schacht's influential work begins another trend to look at Sunni Islam as developing out of the schools of law. His main the main premises of Schacht's influential work are that the bulk of hadiths were mainly circulated after the time of a Shafi, so they were fabricated, most legal traditions came about in the middle of the second century. So second century folks said, well, here's a bunch of laws. We need to make up a hadith to support this. So people follow this law and they just made up a bunch of hadiths. And then they arbitrarily um, stuck isnads to justify or to uh, bolster that hadith tradition. So this is a theory uh, that was prominent, prevalent maybe in the 80s. Um, so uh, what he's saying, most legal traditions came about in the middle of the second century. There is a backward growth of isnads in which the authority they claim increases until reaching the time of the prophet. And the evidence found does not date hadith trans traditions earlier than the first Islamic century, meaning there were no such things as hadith before the first century. So the critique here is the methodology through which Schacht arrived at these sweeping conclusions is problematic due, uh, due to his use of sources not directly related to the field of hadith sciences to undermine the claim to authenticity of these hadiths, while ignoring other hadith sources which are not only important contributions to the genre of hadith works, but were also contemporary to or predated Shafi'i upon which Schacht relies so heavily to make his vast conclusions. So he is making a claim about hadith without looking at hadith texts. He's focusing on texts of law, and he is ignoring hadiths that predate a shafi. And he's claiming that hadith started with a shafi. So, so Lucas writes, while it is logical to use treatises by a few prominent scholars in order to understand their individual styles of legal reasoning, it is a grave error to ignore entirely the evidence pre present in hadith collections that were compiled simultaneously with and prior to the lives of these jurists. How is it possible that a generation or two of scholars invented tens of thousands of hadiths between the lifetimes of a Shafi'i and Ibn Hanbal. The only way to ignore this question is to blind oneself to the 30,000 hadith musnad of the latter and adhere to the works of the scholars who are rarely, if ever, included among the lists of the great compilers and critics of hadith. Indeed, the thought of espousing such a theory of hadith on the basis of a few books that have never been considered part of the genre of hadith literature seems to be risky at best and methodologically sound, unsound at worst. And then I add in my book uh, to Scott Lucas's argument, um, the methodologically flawed approach Schacht is for, of Schacht is further ex exacerbated by the fact that he doesn't look at biographical dictionaries. So he doesn't look at the source either. Not only does he not look at hadith texts to make a claim about hadith, he also doesn't look at biographical dictionary uh, literature or tabaqat literature. So this is from my book. 
pages 71 and 72. This is a quote from my book. Uh, biographical dictionaries are so vast in their volumes, sources, and geographic origins while corroborating the claims made regarding the identities of the individuals in isnads of hadiths that it is difficult to argue that isnads and the whole isnad system upon which books, scholarly connections, and standards of measuring the reliability of reports are based is all an elaborate fabrication or conspiracy. As argued by Matsky in his article, Dating Muslim Traditions, regardless of whether a hadith is in fact an accurate articulation of the words of the prophet, the overwhelming amount of material in the classical biographic dictionaries suggests that the isnads do, uh, do in fact generally reflect uh, a genuine transmission process rather than a later arbitrary association of these isnads with the, bodies of, with the body of hadiths as previously assumed. So this is a longer discussion and I don't wanna overwhelm all of you. Um, the earliest extant biographical dictionary of uh, religious scholars is Kitab Tabaqat al-Kabir by Muhammad ibn Sa'ad. This is Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad, a younger contemporary of the jurist as uh, Shafi upon whom Shaft relied so heavily upon his theories. Ibn Sa'd's book is a veritable history of thousands of hadith transmitters and is arranged both geographically and chronologically. So this is an example of a biographical dictionary, one out of many different types, and what the problem is in making the assumption that hadiths were fabricated and uh, isnads were attached to them. Uh, the basic unit of time is the tabaqa, or generation, and Ibn Sa'd groups scholars according to their primary city, or region of residence, generation by generation, back to the earliest generations of Muslims, the sahaba, or companions of the Prophet. One would have to consider the entire multi-volume book to be a forgery in order to subscribe to Shaft's thesis. Although Shah cites the Leiden edition of Ibn Sa'd's book in his bibliography, it is clear that he rejected the veracity of the, major of the vast majority of its contents when he postulated his theories concerning Hadith transmission. So this is also from Lucas. So Scott Lucas's work was really important for developing my own book further. He and I had the same advisor and He's also a, a graduate from the University of Chicago. So my work builds upon his theory and expands it further. Uh, one more problem with Shaq's theory of the formation of Sunni identity. Shaq's argument that Sunni identity developed through the formation of legal schools that fabricated hadiths to justify their legal position ignores the fact that the overwhelming number of hadith literature is not legal in nature at all. So most hadiths we have don't even talk about Islamic law. What about all of those other hadiths? Did they, why did they fabricate those? So Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Proto-Sunnis. Hadith scholars in the, the uh, in the theology sectarian-based approach of Wat Rahman and Van S were largely ignored because they are most often not known for their sectarian stances. So these scholars, Wat, uh, Wat Rahman, and Van S who were making an argument for uh, defining Sunni Islam based on theology, ignored Hadith scholars because they were not they didn't make by and large. Um, theological stances. They weren't involved in those theological debates. Um, what they also ignore is that all of Islamic knowledge was classified as hadith in the first uh, two Islamic centuries. And uh, this is not, and this is, there's also a distinction between Ahl al Hadith, which come about later, versus Ahl al Ra'i, so not to be confused uh, with that. So Sunnah and Jama'ah, what are they? So Sunnah would be Hadith, Amal Ahl al Medina, for example, or it could be Amal Ahl al Kufa, because many of the Sahaba settled in Kufa. Uh, the Sunnah as practice all came together to be preserved in practice, oral tradition, and then later in writing during Ibn al Mubarak's time. So this is 
It's not just words of the prophet that were preserved, but his entire actions, the way he lived his life, what did he do, what would Muhammad do in this situation? That's all, that was all considered sunnah at the time. Jama'a was the group. So what group? My argument is that it is the network of scholars. So this is also from my book, pages 73 to 74. Ibn al-Mubarak's career as a scholar offers a window into the practical application of how one important individual in this network of hadith scholarship <clears throat> that would define the Sunni tradition represented the scholarly milieu that formed the backbone of Ahl sunnah wa jamaa or proto-Sunnis. In our brief examination of the tabaqa, or generation of scholars preceding Ibn al-Mubarak as related in biographical dictionaries, as well as the generation of scholars following Ibn al-Mubarak's, we see an interconnectedness that held both symbolic and scholarly significance to the early Muslim community. The symbolic significance was that because of the network of Hadith scholars that preserved much of Islamic knowledge in the form of Hadith, so remember theology, spirituality, piety, all of these were preserved in the form of Hadith. So you'd have Hadith about spirituality, you'd have hadith about piety, you'd have hadith about uh, ritual. So everything was preserved in the form of hadith. So the symbolic significance was that because of the network of hadith scholars that preserved much of Islamic knowledge in the form of hadith, Muslims could lay claim to a continuity of their tradition that has been preserved through Isnad. This would become viewed over time as Sunni Islam's normative scholastic tradition that was passed on from each generation of scholars to another. Jama'a was also the larger Muslim community <clears throat> um, because in accepting a scholar, they had to do a background check on each of these scholars, right? And that background check depended upon the people accepting the piety of that scholar. So if the people rejected that scholar, it didn't matter if he uh, transmitted great hadiths. He would still be regarded, his hadith would still be rejected because the people did not regard him as a, a pious figure. So the jama'a has two sides of it. It has the people who would... Uh, recognize a scholar's piety when during right? so the background check that they would do, as well as other scholars within the network of scholars who would recognize their scholarship as um, within the realm or within the boundaries of what they perceived or what they defined as being mainstream Sunni Islam. So, you know, perhaps it's similar to a Protestant congregationalist model. Would you guys say that? We have two pastors here, maybe. So uh, in the Protestant model, the congregation, the people have a role in um, electing their pastors, right, their leaders. It's not just a top-down appointment of a religious leader. If the, if the congregation does not accept the, uh, the leader, then that person cannot lead them. Um, so similarly, within the, this network of Islamic scholars, the people's <laughs> acceptance of them were part of their, um, were part of their uh, being a part of that network. So this is a little bit um, of a tangent, but the, this is where I, it would be argued that a theocracy is antithetical to the structure of Sunni Islam. You might have heard some people um, erroneously might say Islam is a theocracy, it's not. Because in a theocracy, what you have is an imam. The imam equals the political leader. And the imam and the political leader are the same person, and they make both religious and secular laws, and then the people have to follow them. So it's structured like this. Do you see how they... Does the arrow show on here? It doesn't show... Can you see the arrow on the screen? No. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, so there's an arrow. So it could also be a top down. So the imam is on top with an arrow going to religious and secular laws with an arrow to the people. Now, uh, the argument can be made this is more in the hierarchical 
uh, clergy system within the Shia model, but in the Sunni model, this is uh, more like it. So the division of powers in the Sunni and pol uh, Sunni political and social structures is that there is a separation between the those in political authority and those who have religious authority, and that separation over centuries has been guarded really uh, vehemently, because um, if you have people in political power making religious rulings and laws and uh, also commenting on how people should practice their faith, then there's corruption and there's also a lack of diversity that comes about, lack of ikhtilaf, diverse opinions that uh, the Islamic tradition guards and preserves. So by the time of the Mamluks, the, um, it, there was a clear division in Islamic political thought of the political leader and the religious leader. So the political leader would be the Sultan, the Caliph. He made secular laws, Kanun, and um, the government was decentralized. So the government did not know what was happening in Khurasan and in Kufa, and even certain things like spying on citizens or what happens inside of a home. All of those things were forbidden in Islamic law. Uh, so that preserved the, uh, this type of a distance and a separation. Whereas religious practice, remember, is determined by religious leaders who affirm other religious leaders, as well as the people who affirm those religious leaders as piety. And then those religious leaders will determine religious practice. Does this make sense? Is, this is, is, is it only piety? Because I know that, that, that memory and, and uh, also played an important role. I mean, yeah. So and so was good at hadith transmission until he got to 60 years of age yeah. and, and then he kind of he, he wasn't reliable anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's not just piety. So um, because the lay person wouldn't know how to test their memory in sure. hadith, yeah. it would have been the scholars who would test their memory. Yeah. But the lay people would know from interacting with that person whether they're sincere or not. Yeah, whether they're ethical or not. So in my book, I do go into a little bit more detail about this. I talk about Hassan al-Basri, who is in works of hadith. His hadith is really not, take, it, it's not regarded highly. So he's not a hadith, uh, he's not a strong hadith transmitter. And yet he has all of this literature about his piety. So, you know, this indicates a, um, a sense by looking at these types of examples. And I mentioned Ibn Nahiya as well, who was a weak hadith transmitter that Ibn Mubarak still learned from. You know, if you were trying to um, fabricate something or make it yourself look like a strong transmitter, you just kind of conveniently remove Ibn Nahiya from your list of people that he studied from, but that's not the case, right? Or Hassan al-Basri that everybody loved and revered. Well, how is it that his hadith were rejected though? You know, so this indicates, uh, this gives confidence in the system of uh, the rigor that was used to verify hadith transmission. So um, did all, did this make sense? So this is a theocracy, this is what, uh, Theocratic model is. So the leader the, makes the laws and the people follow, whereas within um, Sunni practice, there is that clear separation. In addition to this, you have awqaf, which are uh, religious foundations that provided economic independence to religious leaders from the state. Um, there's a book by John Walbridge called God and Logic in Islam. He goes into detail about this, if you're interested in researching this. Uh, religious leaders exerted some influence over rulers and at other times were feared because of the power they had over influencing the people who loved them. So people loved the religious leaders, so the religious leaders were able to advise the rulers. Uh, Imam is not the religious leader. The political leader is not like the Pope in Sunni Islamic thought. Governments were decentralized and thus embraced diversity. 
and tolerance. So because they were de decentralized, there was it was possible to have a variety of opinions. When the Ottomans attempted to centralize the Islamic Empire, the Ottoman Empire under Sultan Abdul Hamid, that's when everything actually fell apart because he tried to have control over the empire, Sultan Abdul Hamid, and what happened was people started to become aware of their differences um, in a way that they weren't before. So for example, he tried to impose the Ottoman language being taught in, uh, in high schools. Well, before people had different education systems and they, um, they learned in Kurdish, they learned in Charkas, they learned in Arabic and Turkish, they had different languages and Greek, different languages they studied with. So using one language for the state actually alienated many uh, people who are part of that empire and it weakened rather than strengthened it. So what do I say about ISIS here? This is a mutation of the modern political system. So this system that you have, where you have individuals uh, rooting for an Islamic state, this is not a historic reality. This is a new modern concept. Sunni Islam historically separated between religion and politics. <clears throat> And uh, in the colonial period, one of the things that uh, the nation states do is they usurp the al-Qaf system and put them under the ministries of the state so that the foundation, the, the uh, what, do you, what do you call financial it? Financial independence. Right, the foundations are no longer financially independent of the state. So each state like Al-Azhar becomes under the state of uh, the country of Egypt, the leadership of Egypt, or like in Turkey, you have a religious endowments, a ministry of religious endowments. So the Al-Qaf become taken under the state, and as a result, uh, one of the um, outcomes is that they lose their independence of the government from the government. And again, that's a modern development. That's not how uh, Sunni Islam historically operated. So another interesting uh, distinction between Sunni and Shia Islam is the concept of isma, which is protection, or um, you might say um, protection from sin or protection from error. Infallibility. Infallibility might be one way to translate it. So it, within the Sunni tradition, the protection is in the community, the whole jama'ah. So by being a member of that jama'ah, uh, of the entire group, the entire group is protected from going astray as a group. Whereas in the Shia tradition, infallibility or protection from sin is in, in the individual imams. And then uh, the community follows those imams or emulates those imams through taqlid. So this is another distinction between Sunni and Shia um, perspectives of how they understand uh, uh, isma. And this, in turn, goes into the concept of continuity and authority. So within the Sunni tradition, the concept of continuity, how do we know that the Islam we have today is actually what Prophet Muhammad taught? So for Sunnis, the idea of the Isnad system that we've been covering until now is central and key to that, right? So it's the idea of transmission from generation to generation to generation. And these are uh, individuals who are scholars and teachers and religious leaders who are recognized by the people as well as their peers. Whereas in the uh, Shia tradition, continuity and authority comes through imams, through individual uh, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad who, um, who are regarded as uh, having special authority. And Maria de Cake writes about this, if you're interested in looking more into this. Maria de Cake in her work uh, refers to this as charismatic authority in the Shia tradition. So I, was, I always tell Maria, I wrote the Sunni version of your book. So she asked, well, what is Shia Islam? And how do they um, uh, understand the transmission of their teaching uh, in terms of, you know, how do they explain what they have, uh, the authority that they have in their religious tradition? She, she asked that question and talks about that in her book, and I asked the same question and look at it from a Sunni perspective. 
So we talked a little bit about piety. In the texts of hadith, the term that's used is adala. So is that they were people who were upright. So personal piety and ethical conduct were the bedrock of rejection and acceptance of hadith, as we mentioned. Um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> This meant that theological positions that the scholars deemed heretical, like the Jabriya, the Qadariya, were excluded from being a part of the network of Hadith scholars that were the proto-Sunnis. Um, second, it <coughs> indicates that early Muslims did not just see Islam <coughs> as a set of rules, but also a spiritual way of being in which piety was a foundational aspect of the philosophy of Islam. So if Muslims just thought Islam was a bunch of rules, here's someone who memorized hadith really well and they transmit it really well, that's good enough for me. But no, so the, the whole jarh wa ta'adil genre, this hadith criticism genre, indicates that piety and their ethical conduct, how they lived their lives, was also part and parcel in identifying whether someone truly represented um, uh, Islamic leadership or not. Which takes me to the next section, which is Zuhd. <clears throat> so this is the second section of, or the third section of my book. And um, I asked the question, what is Zuhd? There are a number of articles that had been written on Zuhd before I wrote on this, and they often define it as asceticism. And the argument was also that uh, some of these practices were derived from the Christian monastic tradition in greater Syria, those ascetic practices. Um, in examining Ibn al-Mubarak's book in particular, I argue that a better translation is piety because that's how he formulates it in his book. Uh, the chapters in his book are aspects of piety. They're not aspects of asceticism per se. So they're not aspects of what you should abstain from, what you shouldn't do, but they're aspects of how to be a good, pious, spiritual person. Um, and this is significant because it indicates the prominence of piety as being integral to the Islamic worldview from its earliest period. Islamic faith was also emphasizes a way of being from within and living an ethical life. This was known as Zuhd. Um, many Oriental scholars have argued that uh, spirituality came into the Islamic uh, tradition later as Islam spread eastward and uh, came into contact with either Hindu and Buddhist traditions or with um, Christian monasticism in greater Syria. But um, I argue in the book through looking at Islamic scripture and the way Ibn al-Mubarak, who is a core hadith transmitter, uh, uh, for, uh, compiles books of hadith solely or specifically about Islamic spirituality, I, I argue in the book that what we find is that ethical conduct, spirituality, was something that was a part of the Islamic mindset from its inception and not something that was imported later on. Um, Ibn al-Mubarak is the rich ascetic. So there are different devotional styles that Alexander Kanish has written on. Um, his de uh, devotional style was that um, they lived in the world without being worldly. Uh, he and his teacher, Sufyan Athori, were all actually rich merchants. So they had lots of money. But they were Zahid. So how does that work? So Kanish talks about three devotional styles. The Ibrahim ibn Adham is an extreme form of asceticism. So he used to wear wool in the summer. Why do you wear wool in the summer? Because it's very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. So being uncomfortable is perceived as good and pious. So Ibrahim ibn Adham used to wear wool. And some say the term Sufi comes from the term Suf. So there are people who used to wear wool in the summer. And there's others who say, no, it comes from Safa. So there are different arguments on where the term comes from, but it was known that there were certain people who used to wear wool in the summer because it was uncomfortable. 
Um, they didn't eat a lot. They didn't marry. They didn't own wealth. This is Ibrahim ibn Adham. Um, this form is said to have been influenced by uh, Christian asceticism in Syria at the time as a form of piety. Farqad al-Sabakhi is an Armenian Christian who converted to Islam and is reported to have quoted from the Bible in his sermons. He wears wool and there's a debate over his wearing wool. He's criticized for it. So the wearing of wool is actually something that um, uh, Muslims are debating at that time. Um, Fudayl ibn Ayyab is, he is, focuses on sadness and fear. So fear of God's punishment and he's always sad. So this is the second devotional style. The third devotional style is Ibn al-Mubarak. So he model, he's a model of the more sober form of piety um, where he didn't uh, detach himself from the world completely. He simply detached his heart from being attached to the world. Um, it is this style that make up the networks of Sunni Muslims who then determine which form of piety is considered to be mainstream. So this form of practice became accepted within that network of hadith transmitters. So they have the privilege then, they're in a, priv they're in a privileged position of, in a way, determining what is mainstream Islamic tradition and what is not. So uh, even though there is a form of asceticism influenced, influenced by Christian monasticism of greater Syria, um, and their practices were similar to Ibrahim ibn Adham, this does not enter the mainstream practice since they are not the scholars in the networks of knowledge of transmission. Ibn al-Mubarak publishes a book of Zuhd, which is actually a book of hadith. So these are um, hadiths related from the Prophet who talk about um, different ways of being a good person from within. So these are sayings of the Prophet and the Sahaba and their students. And he also rejected wearing wool and he called it a bid'ah. This was uh, Ibn al-Mubarak's view of this. Uh, what's significant also is that Ibn al-Mubarak's work initiate an entire genre of works on piety known as the Kutub al-Zuhd. So this is, he's the first known uh, uh, Kitab al-Zuhd that we have, and then a number of others start to write within this genre. And these later become sources for al-Qushayri, Risalat al-Qushayriya, and Ghazali, who develop Islamic spirituality into a, a field known as Tasawwuf, a couple of centuries later. So there is a distinction between tasawwuf, tariqah, mysticism, and I talk about that in detail in my book. And I know we're short on time, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail on that. Um, so considering that all of Islamic knowledge in the early period was preserved in the form of hadith, including piety and spirituality, uh, the fact that you have books of hadith doesn't mean that they focus just on legal matters or, or things related to um, the outer aspects of practice. Uh, these books of hadith became known as the Kutub al-Zuhd, Ibn al-Mubarak, Bayhaqi, Waqi'a ibn Jarrah, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you all know these, these are big hadith names, right? Were all foundational hadith transmitters. Uh, they were proto-Sunnis, and they also wrote about Islamic spirituality, which later uh, evolves into Sufism. So proto-Sunnis overlap as proto-Sufis. The role of writers such as Ibn al-Mubarak, Waqi'a ibn Jarrah, and al-Bayhaqi of much of these books on piety as major hadith transmitters and essential figures in the network of Sunni scholarship indicate that their vision of piety was not an offshoot of a mainstream form of a more rigid so-called Islamic orthodoxy, but that rather these views of Islamic piety were the very products of the Sunni Islam, which these figures were known to represent. So what that means is you might have heard that um, there is often a misconception that Islam, is, that orthodox Islam is harsh, rigid, mean, right? And like the soft, gentle, kind people, those are the nice Sufis, right? 
So, but what I'm arguing in the book is that actually those very same people who transmitted uh, Hadith and Sunni Islam were the same people who wrote about Islamic spirituality, whose works find their way into later uh, foundational Sufi texts. So that's what I mean when I say, but rather these views of Islamic piety were the very products of the Sunni Islam, which these figures were known to represent. So the same people who wrote on Hadith wrote on Islamic spirituality. And I think this is the last slide. Carl Ernst writes, the history of the study of Sufism shows how powerfully the Orientalist discourse on religion reformulated aspects of Islamic culture into a separate category called Sufism. At the same time, growing fundamentalist movements in Muslim countries have isolated and rejected many aspects of what we call Sufism as part of the struggle over ownership of Islamic religious symbolism. The fact that these debates have taken place in the colonial and post-colonial periods indicates that modernity is crucial to understanding Sufism. Yet the, cla the, classicist bias of Oriental the classicist bias of Orientalism and the strikingly similar Golden Age historiography of fundamentalism have conspired to keep Sufism separate from modernity. And that is the end. Thank you so much for that insightful talk, Dr. Salem. We're going to open up for questions. Comments? Could you tell more about the process of choosing the, uh, the, the people acceptance of the hadith? This yeah. is interesting. Like, how did it look like? Yeah. Was it a certain number of people, election? Or? Yeah. So it was actually a background check. So so and so is transmitting a hadith before people accept his hadith as an actual saying of the Prophet that will make its way into scripture. They would do a really um, rigorous background check on that person. And what among the things that would entail is to go to his town, his village, his homeland, ask questions about him. How does he live? What does he do? Has he done anything that you see as um, contradictory to Islamic ethics? So they would go and really investigate those people. And it was considered halal, permissible, to uh, um, give information that was negative about somebody um, for the purposes of uh, a background check on their hadith. The day, for the day, is that a couple of people? Or, and who is it devoted? Yeah, so you have a group of hadith scholars whose fields become uh, hadith criticism. So uh, we talked about Ibn, uh, Ibn Ma'in, right? So he's a specialist in that field. So. Uh, by the third, late second, third century, you see a specialization in different fields of Islamic studies. And there are those whose specialization is just in the transmission of hadith. There are those whose specialization is in Islamic law, fiqh. Then there are those whose specialization is in verification of individuals. And many times those people overlap. So people who knew hadith also knew the transmitters of hadith. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a question. Um, I, I didn't. I must. I must have missed missed something. Um, when did uh, um, your author die? One eighty one. So he didn't go through the the the, the mehna of, of the early Abbasid period. I mean, uh, no, he would have been dead by then. All right, all right, because because yeah. his student Ibn Hamban, of course, suffered and Malik suffered and, and so forth. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. That that, uh, that helps. Mashallah. Yeah, you can ask as many as you like. This is a good question. Okay. Um, so if there is a, a separation in the earlier, um, so people, uh, separation, there's a separation between the religious, theological, and the political. Uh -huh. If in today's age we have certain laws that are, for example, written in the Constitution of Laws, 
and the rules. And in regards to religion, and I'm and I'm thinking about the law against proselytizing, which in Christianity within certain countries uh -huh. is would that be against or going in opposition to the early understanding of uh, the division or well um Technically, governments can make any laws that they view as beneficial for their community. So the argument can be made whether that's a beneficial law or not. But can a state do that? They have the power to do that. But what the question then would be, is that something that we would want or not? Yeah. And that's a different topic. Yeah. Yes. So when you when you say this term Sufi or King or whatever uses we use it today. Yeah, that's really interesting because by Abdul Qahir al Baghdadi's period, he lived around three hundred, maybe th the middle of the three hundreds, he uses both the term Sunni and Sufi. So um but when exactly does it come into mainstream usage? That's a good question. I don't really know the answer. Are you referring to Abu Qadr uh, al No, Baghdadi, who was a hadith transmitter. He was also a um, theologian. He was a student of, um, no, no. he was a Ash'ari. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not sure exactly when it becomes prevalent. Uh, if they were, if there was debate over the wearing of wool in the second century, then it, the term must have been used maybe even in a way that was derogatory for some individuals because, oh, they wear wool, if that's really um, where the, the word came from. Because then there's others who say, no, it comes from Safa. So. But you might know better than I the answer to that. Uh, but in, in, the, in the Shia world at the same time, it, it wasn't used. Yeah, no, the Shias use different terminology for Islamic spirituality, like Irfan and other terms. Sufi is a very Sunni term <laughs> until the present, this last century, where it's it, it's been made, um, pop, it's been popularized by New Age movements in the 60s and all of that. Yeah. Um, there was an aspect to what you were talking about historically um, and it seemed to to gloss over some very early Islamic history um, um, certainly the Khulafa uh -huh. Rashidun um, were both religious imams and they gave khutbah and they uh, and 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 they had supreme secular authority as well I yeah mean, they they, they they led, I mean, led armies or directed armies, and, 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 and the whole apparatus of the state was sort of under their charge. They appointed governors. Um, um, could, could, could one imagine that ISIS, and, and I agree with you the way you define them, but I mean, couldn't, couldn't they argue that that's their model? I mean, and that's the golden age. I mean, they're not talking about Mamluks. I mean, yeah. Uh, but would you say that the caliphs had a monopoly on defining religious practice? Like uh, Omar, for example, was he the only religious person that would have had a say? No, I mean he wasn't. He, he, he wasn't a pope in that sense. He, I mean, he was called a Amir al um, <clears throat> and and and. Uh, 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 Khalifa. Uh, and Khalifa means that, that you're somebody that 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 carries on what what the prophet yeah. brought. I mean, even if it's not totally clarified and classified and canonized and so forth. Um, but there were cert there was certainly a, a combination of of um, of se of secular power and, and religious authority. I mean, um, uh, certainly under Omar, I mean, but, but, I mean, but he didn't invent his own laws. I mean, it was, it was, 
it, it, and he would have had a council of other other pious individuals, Sahaba, um, uh, and he himself hadn't even met. I mean, none, none of the first four kitas were half of the Quran. I mean, yeah. none of them. I mean, uh, because they were, it was a very busy period, and um, you had to have a lot of time to, to, to sit with your teacher and, and memorize that. But when he did not finally memorize Surah Al-Baqarah, he slaughtered a camel in celebration. I mean, or maybe it was a, a cow, but there were not many cows in Medina. Yeah, I mean, the first caliph certainly saw the preservation of the message of the Prophet Muhammad as important as a part of their role as caliph. But um, unlike in the Shia tradition, they didn't have this uh, monopoly or this perception of being infallible True. where they were the True. source of religious information. What should we do? Absolutely. And we see there was a lot of difference of opinion with them. And we even see like, I mean, there is the, there's a report where Omar says, what would you do if you saw me going astray? They say to him, we'll straighten you out with this or the sword. Right, right, right. So the, the, in the Sunni perception, or the Sunni worldview, there is a concept that, yes, the early, in the early period, the caliphs were good people, but they weren't, they, they, they weren't masum, they weren't right. infallible, nor were they necessarily the first authority or the only authority in religious matters. Right. Um, but when they made laws and rules, they did try to also in, uh, have the interest of the preservation of faith in their in their thinking. Right, and one of the great criticisms aimed at the Umawi dynasty is that in fact it was a dynasty. I mean, because yeah. the first caliphs had been chosen in, in, in as many ways as there were different caliphs. Uh, First of all, yeah. Well, Sunni political thought then becomes uh, realist and saying, look, this is an idealistic period. We can't expect this to last forever. And as long as the caliph isn't outwardly sinning or doing things that are um, that contradict uh, the principles of the of the people, he could do whatever he wants in his palace right. as long as he's right. defending the country. Right. Yeah. So the Sunnis were realists in that sense, but from the Shia perspective, it was important that the religious leader was also a person of spiritual authority. Right, right, and Masum. Yeah, yeah who was infallible yeah. and a descendant of the Prophet of Muhammad. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question. Yeah. So, uh, Christy and I both are, are struck by uh, having just a, a kind of uh, introductory uh, understanding of even Al Mubarak's uh, work. And I think a few pages into chapter four, um, and we get a sense that uh, they would have a lot to say uh, to the Protestants, Christians, who are very much uh, trying to reclaim uh, an ascetic practice in everyday life. Uh, those who are uh, very much wanting to practice something, um, but without relocating to a monastery. Uh, so just uh, wondered if you would have more to say about that and, and uh, uh, highlight some of the, the more important things that Daniel Bark might have to say. Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, Ibn al-Mubarak's devotional style was to cultivate within himself a sense of piety and to not be attached to the world. But he was very wealthy. And we see many reports that he would be, he was a merchant, so he'd get all of this um, wealth, and then he'd redistribute it. And then he'd get wealth again, and he'd redistribute it. He, what's interesting is a couple of reports. First, when he's asked why he keeps so much wealth, he, one of the things he says is it preserves one's dignity and their piety. And that's really, and I talk about that in the book. It's really interesting because um, he has a different perception from like the, uh, Ibrahim ibn Adham or Fudayr ibn Ayyad. So the, the idea is, is that um, it enables one to be grateful to God. It enables one to um, 
uh, to preserve their dignity among the people. So he wasn't against having money or having wealth. Um, the other thing that you see in reports is that he would invite students, and students were known to not have a lot of means. So he would feed them and give them uh, really expensive sweets and not eat them himself. So that was his way of disciplining his, his, um, his desires, was to uh, give to others, but to uh, limit what he consumed himself. And to hide his piety externally, he just looked like everyone else, but that piety of his was maintained internally. So if you saw him, you'd be like, wow, this is just some rich guy off the street. How is he so pious? And he, that, was, that was a form of practice that he and Sufyan Athori and others like him maintained. And um, the argument I make because of their privileged status within that network of scholars, that that form of piety also becomes accepted as mainstream. We're about out of time. Does anyone have any last burning questions? No. Okay, please, can we give another round of applause for Dr. Fernandez?